This is the Bears Barroom Radio Network. The following program is recorded live and intended for all audiences. Radio is scripted now. We just come up with it. We don't use computers. We don't rehearse. We're going to talk about this next. We're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about the Bulls. And then we're going to have Brad Big Son. And then we're going to have all this. No. No. If you don't know what you're going to talk about in the top of your head before a show, you shouldn't be in the business. I don't know what you got. I feel like Vince Vaughn in, in a couple's retreat. The sharks are circling. Old school, baby. You're listening to the Mike North Advantage, and it begins right now. That's right. The Mike North Advantage starts right now. I am Aldo Gandia, Mike Swingman, and happy holidays to everyone. And boy, oh boy, Mike has done it again. He's got another great guest for us. And of course, I'm going to let Mike do the official introduction. I am just going to say that I am so looking forward to this interview with Mike and his guest. I am also going to say that Mike and I are going to talk Chicago Bears. We're going to talk about a little bit about the Chicago Bulls and their upcoming season. And who knows what else we're going to talk about, but we're going to have fun. That's what we do here. And Mike's got some picks for us to gamble on. He's always red hot with his picks. So let's introduce Mike now. Mike North, how are you, my friend? Oh, well, do never been better. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I had one of the greatest weeks of my life. Because once again, ladies and gentlemen, the proof is in the pudding. The call that I made with Mitch Trubisky at the beginning of the season, where his, uh, he started because only because of COVID-19, uh, otherwise they would have had full start. Uh, then full started, and then all of a sudden Trubisky is back, uh, one of the top quarterbacks in the game right now, averaging 30 points a game the last three weeks. They uh, put up uh, uh, graphics. Also, all of a sudden now there's Mitch Trubisky positive brackets coming from Pro football focus, pro football this, pro football that, uh, saying that his rating's higher than any bear in history. And I would ask everybody this. This information would have come in handy for a lot of people before they went off the cliff and decided to take Nick Foles. I already had that information because I actually watched what happened last year with Nick Foles. But I think things have straightened out. We're one game back. We're not out of it. But if we don't win it, I think we will all, and I think you could agree with this, Blame some of the media, blame Matt Nagy, blame Ryan Pace for bringing Foles in, and Matt Nagy himself did the unconscionable. If we don't make the playoffs, the head coach of the football team derailed the season of the Chicago Bears. I think that's excellent analysis. I actually heard a couple of guys, I forgot on which show, they asked the question, do you think uh, Matt Nagy ruined the Chicago Bears season by starting mm-hmm. Nick Foles. And uh, it's starting to look that way, isn't it? Well, yeah, and it doesn't surprise me. But if you've been listening to me throughout the years, um, when you see that the Cookie Cutter talk show hosts, not all, but most of them, like Foles or columnists, and if you look back at the columns from the summer, you see that there was a concerted effort to make sure he started at the beginning. That didn't happen because of lack of uh, practice time. But I did talk to people that I know that were at the practices that said that on not one day, maybe one, Nick Foles outplayed Mitch Trubisky. And yet when he made the one mistake uh, against Atlanta, where I suggested, so Eldo knows this, I'm not a second guesser. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy that has uh, foresight, not hindsight. I said, I'd like to, keep it like this with Foles coming off the bench if Mitch uh, if Mitch struggles because he's a growing quarterback. Well, now he's growing, but it's unbelievable that I'm seeing guys like Wentz, Cam Newton, and others without offensive lines that are ruined, yet Mitch Trubisky's pulled off the improbable. He hasn't had an offensive line for three years, and he's one of the top quarterbacks right now in the last three weeks in the game. And the offensive line last week, it just seems like everybody's playing better with him behind center. And all of a sudden, Montgomery's running the football better. The offense is suited for Mitch. They started rolling him out last week. And I I would say this. If they don't want to bring Matt Nagy back, put Laser in charge as a head coach and let him be the offensive coordinator. Because you know what? To get rid of Mitch Trubisky at the end of the year and bring in a new guy, the same pair of people that wanted Mitch out will be crying that somebody else has got us at 4-12 next year. 
here's an interesting stat. Uh, Mitch Trubisky has started six games this season. In three of those games, he's thrown three touchdown passes. Half right. of his games, three touchdown passes. That's pretty impressive. And then you hear people saying he's a bust. Now, if you see Twitter on North to North, ladies and gentlemen, just follow me on Twitter, and then you'll be smarter than most of the people that are on the air or writing the columns. In fact, uh, you'll see that, that when, when you look at Mitch Trubisky and then you look at Nick Foles, there was no comparison. There's none. They were averaging 31 points a game, and Foles was averaging 19. Uh, Montgomery was just horrible. And I think you've been a big Montgomery fan. Mm-hmm. I think the worst thing that would happen to Montgomery now is if uh, Mitch got hurt, because then Foles would be under the statue that you don't have to key on and that you don't have to worry about. So the wide, uh, the offense is wide open. I thought the Bears were laying in wait for Deshaun Watson. Here's another stat that Bear fans did not know, and Bear uh, uh, media didn't want to tell you. With the win last week against Houston, Mitch Trubisky's winning percentage as a starter now is higher than Deshaun Watson's. And, and, I go by head-to-head. The Deshaun Watson narrative is done. Is done. Because Mitch Trubisky, like a Twitter said today, outplayed him and dominated him for 60 minutes. Well, um, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put the exclamation point on Dunn because he's got to prove it over these last three games. He's got to build on this, and I'm not saying he has to throw another three touchdown game at U.S. Bank Stadium against the Vikings, but he's he, you know, he can't go back to th- you know having a two turnover game, three turnover game, which has... I don't know why not when other quarterbacks do it every week. <laughs> And they're starting. I don't know why Mitch Trubisky's not allowed to. See, see, you just basically said it. Uh, you know, if he makes another mistake or two, I, you know, he's out again. That's what you said. And I, I got to be honest with you. I think when people's narratives are stuck in one spot, and I don't think you have this narrative, but, you know, people, you don't know this. Bears Barroom has a great halftime show. Thank it you. really does, with John Buffon and, and Tyler. Aldo. Yeah. And I watched uh, the first, you know, most of it. And I got to be honest with you, although I was nonplussed by your reaction. I think you expected the whole different outcome, just like 90% of the betters who took Houston. Yep. Now I'm hearing Houston wasn't that good. Well, why were they favored? Because they supposedly had the best quarterback, and they didn't. They don't. When it's he- I go head-to-head. Mm-hmm. He had been hearing this, and I think Allen Robinson, I think you'll agree with me on this. I think Allen Robinson, I think the Bears defense, from Mac to everybody else, said, let's shut the talk up about Watson and let's give Mitch some back. And then Mitch did the improbable. I don't know how many Bear quarterbacks have thrown for a 100-plus uh, rating over, over in a two-week span, two mm-hmm. weeks in a row. Mm-hmm. There haven't been many. And I did not know this. Mitch Trubisky is now highly the highest-rated Bear quarterback, including Jay Cutler. So the whole thing's been wonderful for me. Uh, because I was right again, but I'm used to that. And and it's been a nightmare for anybody who went on record and took foes. But I will say this to you. If you took foes and you stuck to your guns, just like I took Trubisky and stuck to my guns, Mm -hmm. I have the ultimate respect for you. But if you took Trubisky at the beginning of the year and then left me, okay, and a couple others Mm -hmm. and went to foes, now what do you do? Because your credibility shot already. Do you go back to Trubisky? And you and I know there's podcasters that we know that did that, and there's talk show hosts that we know did that. So they're in the toughest spot. I think the best thing for them to do would say they miscalculated, they didn't do enough research on Nick Foles, they kept turning back to 2017, and they did look at the Jacksonville years, and then they saw what happened this year. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is, I'm tired of defending Mitch Trubisky, and I said this on Twitter. It's time for the Foles people or the flip-floppers to defend why they were stupid enough to take Foles. Mike, you ever thought about being a lawyer? Because you've made a really (laughs) compelling case. (laughs) Well, my mother wanted me to become one, but then when I walked out of Senate in my second year and went to the beach, I think that was out the window. (laughs) But she always told me and my aunt, you would make a great lawyer. I go, if the evidence is there and people still go against the evidence, 
with which I've seen 70% still. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about this. My buddy Sylvie from ESPN 1000 right. put out a tweet, uh, a feed. Uh, what about, what do you think about the Bears? Do you want them to win or lose? Do you want them to win or lose this week? And there was a big sampling. 60% of Bear fans wanted them to lose. I don't understand that. your point about Trubisky, you all make me sick. And you're not real fans because I want the Bears to win every game. Period of the story. And when they don't, I'm disappointed. And when I when they do, I'm happy as hell. But you're a bunch of losers, and I wouldn't want to be in a foxhole with any one of you. Yeah, and I loved your tweet after that Detroit Lions game uh, when uh, that horrible, horrible, uh, gut wrenching defeat. You you sent out a tweet there saying that you really took this uh, loss hard. Yes. And I, I love that about you. I mean, you are a sharp analyst. You are tough with interviews. You're tough on the teams that you love. But at the same time, when you witness a something that's disappointing, you're not afraid to let people when know. Does Mitch Trubisky get a pat on the back? You know what's funny? The, you know what I hear from the dumbasses? And I mean it. I'm going to beat them all up today. When does Mitch Trubisky get the benefit of the doubt? Mm-hmm. You know what I heard? He pay, played an easy team. Okay, wait a minute. He was a bust, according to you. He wasn't a starter, according to you. But now he's good enough to beat a team. I listed busts. And for people to think Mitch Trubisky's a bust with, uh, with a 27-20 record, 9,000 yards, 61 touchdowns and 34 interceptions, and there are people I know and you know that have said that, you're a disgrace to your profession. A disgrace. And as fans, you're disgraceful. That if you want the Bears to lose, to prove a point, you have to admit you're wrong today and every day. And quit pressing Mitch Trubisky. You know, my gut, my good friend John Yurkovich, you know what he said on Twitter? And I love Yurko. And Yurko's right a lot. But I knew he was wrong about this from the beginning. And, and he said to me, well, what would you give Mitch Trubisky's grade from 1 to 100? And you know what I told him, Eldo? Mm-hmm. I don't let those people set the parameters. I'll give him a C minus because if I give him a C, I'll get, uh, oh, that's a trash take. There's, it, by the way, if you swear on Twitter or if you tell me, like I liked McCann, I wanted him to say, right. well, that's a trash take, Grandel's better. Give me reasons. Otherwise, I'm going to start just getting rid of you. You're not fit to, to even debate me. And how many uh, people will debate you on something and then have to hear, well, that's a trash take. That's not debating. Yeah. That's telling me you're wrong. Right. Right. <laughs> you, you, when you have I'm no... I'm going to start blocking these people because apparently the people they're listening to and reading have to sensitize them to the point where they don't think for themselves anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, is, who is anybody in the paper vehemently defending Trubisky? I can't find many because <laughs> they true. all get together in the summer at training camp and decide who they're going to root for. They're cookie cutter sheep, period. <laughs> hey, I want you to respond to this take from Matt Nagy, the head coach of the Chicago Bears. He's asked a question by our good buddy, your good buddy, Mark Potash of the, the Chicago Sun-Times. He's asked, is, is, is what we're seeing real with uh, Mitch Trubisky? And this no, is... No, it was a <laughs> Jesus effing Christ. Even Potter. Unbelievable. 90 points in three weeks. Is it real? No, nobody else threw it. Mighty Mouse threw it. My God. <laughs> this is what the coach said. When we made the move to Nick, uh, again, at that point in time, it's it's really hard to accept for, for Mitchell, but I do believe that for a lot of different reasons, that's going to end up really helping him out in his career. And what it's done is it's able, it's enabled him to take a step back and see where we're at. And now these last three games, um, we're feeling an identity within right, this offense. <laughs> he goes on to he say, yes. To prove a point, he took an undefeated quarterback out and put a quarterback in that went two and five. And now he's trying to cover his own ass, trying to say he matured. Uh, uh, Mitch Trubisky, what a pissant. I mean, seriously, a football coach who tried to sabotage a kid's career who said he'd never start again, ever, after he was replaced. What what a pissant. 
I, you know what? They could let him go anytime they want. Anytime they want. Because we have a quarterback that we can have for the next three, four years. And here's where the Bears are in the quandary. The Bears are in the quandary because if Mitch leaves, he's going to go play for New England, or he's going to go play for Indy, or he's going to go play for Carolina, or like a Twitter follower said today, and I want your opinion on this, Aldo, because he brought up a great point. How's Cam Newton doing that everybody wanted? How's Teddy Bridgewater doing that everybody wanted for the Bears? How come we're not talking about those guys that have fallen on their face in other places while our guy is playing pro ball football the last three weeks? It's ridiculous. And this nonsense, this nonsense is he real and that I helped his career by sitting him. You sabotaged your own team season because nobody's going to tell me. I don't care who they're playing that we wouldn't have a better record with Mitch. And, 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 and one last thing, because you don't hear this on talk radio. This is called research. I did a little research last night. Tom Brady, would you agree, is the greatest of all time? Absolutely. Would you also agree that Tom Brady had a cakewalk in his own division for 19 years? Absolutely. The Bills, the Jets, the Dolphins. Mm-hmm. Do you know he's 88-22 and 22 against them all time? And did you know... He's 35-3 and three against the Buffalo Bills. But Mitch Trubisky had an easy game last week. Tom Brady had six easy games within his division every year because of the dominance of him, but of his football team and the coach. Period. And all of a sudden, Mitch plays against a bad team, and he's not allowed to. And then I'm hearing, well, the field goal kicker saved one of the games this year. How, how about the parking misses that sunk Mitch and the Bears in previous years? See, people aren't on par with me when, when you want to discuss the ins and outs of the Bears because whatever point you come up with, I will come up with another point that will shut your face, period. woo And I'm done explaining why Mitch Trubisky, why I like Mitch Trubisky. Explain why you wanted that dirty diaper foes to start for you. That's the next thing that I'm going to turn on everybody. I was proven right, and so were some other people. I don't have all the names, because you know what? There weren't many. 90% of Bear fans wanted him out after week three, because they put in a replacement that brought him back and won. How did that work after that? They replaced a starter, period, when they were 2-0 and or 3-0. and Look at it any way you want. Well, I knew that that Matt Nagy soundbite was going to piss you off because oh. that's essential. That's exactly what Nagy did. He basically said he's playing better now because I put Nick Foles what in. A piece of, what a piece of work this guy is. You dumbass. You took him out. Mm-hmm. You took the momentum away. You turned some of the team against you. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee you this. Khalil Mack and the rest of the defense who played probably their best game of the year. Would you agree? Yep got together and said, we got to shut the media up, we got to shut Nagy up, we got to shut everybody up, and we got to shut up all the Watson defenders. Mm -hmm. And they did. They did. It was beautiful. The other thing... It was a beautiful thing, wasn't it? I mean, I was laughing every touchdown, and then I got to (laughs) read, yeah, but it was against so-and-so. Wait a minute. Houston was favored. That's right. (laughs) All of a sudden, I'm hearing they were a shit team. Sorry for the swear, but I can't take it because there's so many dumbasses wearing bear jerseys, walking around like they know everything. They know shit, period. And here's another thing that really pisses me off is that throughout the off season, they re they being the the coaching staff, they build this offense around. Mitch Trubisky's athletic ability. They're, go- they're going to now be under center, take more handoffs, more traditional running with David Montgomery and so forth. And they give up on it three games into the season and they put in a quarterback, Nick Foles, who is not athletic, who does not play well under center. He's a shotgun quarterback who is the total opposite of Mitch Trubisky. It's like, why did you even pick up Nick Foles knowing that he has no relation, no compatibility at all to the guy that you drafted so high? It didn't make any sense from the get-go, and Matt Nagy is a uh, – you, you said it. Uh, was it your piss oh, ant? No, he, he tried to sabotage a guy's season. Now, now this guy may save his, his, his coaching career. <laughs> yeah, how about and, it? <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you about the media. There was a media member, I won't mention his name, but if you do your research, you might be able to find out. They tweeted out 
wow, this, this drive's taken a while, but Houston still got time. And I said to him, and he goes, it's taken too long and that's a problem, but I think Houston still has more time. This is a guy that writes for a Chicago newspaper. So I asked him, I go, what's that? Why is that a problem? Uh, uh, I just want to get out of here. Huh? Oh, my goodness. Huh? <laughs> there are media members who are for and against the Bears just because they want to be right for once in their goddamn lives. That's all. Oh, man. that What a bad Mr. take. Trubisky's a stud. He's a stud. Compared to what we had, you went from a Ferrari to a 64 Rambler with Nick Foles. <laughs> Live with it. Sit in it. That's it. I love it. I love it. So, uh, Bears at U.S. Bank Stadium playing the Minnesota Vikings who are coming off a terrible loss. This game could really propel the Chicago Bears into the wild card race and really solidify their chances. I mean, they win the next two games and other teams lose. They may not even have to beat the Green Bay Packers in the final week of the season to make the playoffs. Well, that's what I'm going to tell you. You brought it up. Well, Mitch can't have another bad game. Foles could have five bad games, six bad games, but it was okay. Cutler could have eight years of bad games. Here's what I'm going to hear. If the Bears lose 35-30, to 30, we got to get rid of Mitch. We got to get – that will be – the dumbasses byline. Hmm. When Mitch went after six weeks off, six weeks of being undercut, okay, fired out of nowhere, saying he was blindsided. Do people realize he went to Green Bay and stuck twenty five points up on them, and they lost the game because of the uh, because of the defense? He threw three touchdowns, and yes, he threw two picks. I would ask you this: If Mitch Trubisky has a bad game on on Sunday. By going to Minnesota, he wouldn't be the only one. But I'll tell you this. I will not let it deter me that he should be our starting quarterback next year. Because if he isn't, he'll be with Josh McDaniel and Bill Belichick in New England. And he'll be in the playoffs for 10 years. Period. Because he'll, there'll be such a great upgrade from Cam Newton because Cam Newton's finished. Yeah, I, I never bought into the Cam Newton thing. But, He's taken so much punishment. Oh, many did? Oh, lots. How many media fans did? Bridgewater. Yep. <laughs> Dalton, uh, well, how are all these guys doing? Mitch, <laughs> Mitch Trubisky is doing better than all of them. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. And he's uh, doing it under the uh, tutelage of a Matt Nagy who, as you said, is a uh, pissant. Is that the word that you use, pissant? Well, you know what's funny? <laughs> Bill Lazor, I, I don't know who he is. I couldn't recognize him on the street. But last week, <laughs> wonderfully called game. Mm-hmm. Could not tell what the next play was going to be. Mm-hmm. With Nagy, it was predictable. Run, run, pass in the pocket. Rolled Mitch out like we wanted him to, Eldo. Mm-hmm. Rolled him this way. Rolled him that way. Right. I mean, remember, this is a new guy that's calling the plays. Yeah. But, my God, Matt Nagy didn't call the plays at Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Andy Reid did. And just like Eric Bieniemy, who's now going to be a coach, I'm going to make a prediction now, and everybody's going to say, you're wrong again, Mike. You're wrong again, Mike, and I'll look at him. Eric Bieniemy is going to get a coaching job, okay? A head coaching job. And when he gets that head coaching job, whether it's Jacksonville, where Ryan Pace has had two quarterbacks that he covered and benched, Glennon and Foles over there. How about that? And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be it's going to be an embarrassment. Uh, that that. It, it just it, it, the whole thing just bog, it boggles my mind the lack of accountability by people that I respect in the business. Wow, great great segment here. What I want to do now, Mike, is take a quick little break, and then we're going to bring in your special guest. Oh, uh, and then we're going to. And then we're going to talk a little bit uh, White Sox, a little bit of because I got to get your take on James McCann. Why you're dialing? Yeah, why you're dialing? I'll 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 continue this narrative really quietly. I want beer fans to quit listening to people and just listen to the bar room, okay? And and, my, and listen to the Mike North advantage and, and start listening to me. I mean, just remember the same media that hates Trubisky gave Cutler eight years. To went to go to one playoff game. Remember that, and and help the Bears sign him to 118. When are you going to stop listening? Asses. Period. <laughs> Period. End of story. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. The man will always be remembered in Chicago. The man got the job done. The man stepped in when there was a plethora of injuries. We'll talk to him about all that, what he's up to now. We're pleased to have on from Ohio State, the man, Mike Tomczak. Hello, Michael. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Yes, good evening. How the hell are you, first of all, my friend? I'm well. I'm well. I'm doing, uh, being safe and, and following the uh, protocol during this pandemic and out there servicing the people and doing some acts of kindness. Well, that's great. And you know what? Uh, not too many people have heard for, uh, from you for a long time. We wanted to get you on. I thank my buddy Munch Bishop for getting me your number out there in Cleveland. Of course, you you go on his show. I got to ask you first off, uh, do you follow the Chicago Bears? Are they still your team? Uh, I know you're out in different uh, locales now doing uh, your fine work, but uh, are you still a bear at heart and watch the games? Absolutely. And you always remember your first employer. You always have uh, strong ties to your first employer. And when you're part of a world championship, Mike, Obviously, they're going to be your favorite team and your best team that you root for. I had Jim McMahon on recently, your good friend, and we talked about the situation when you took over and the mess that it became. He was just, he will not back down from this, and I don't think he should. Uh, The Flutie thing, when that happened, uh, you and Steve Fuller and other guys uh, uh, were the guys that worked your butts off. Uh, and, and, and Jim McMahon says to this day, I will never back down from that decision. He said he told Doug Flutie, uh, and they've patched things up, not that there was any animosity. I think Doug understood after a while that, look, Doug, you got to understand, Mike Tomczak was with the Bears, and he had earned this spot. And it would have been bad on our part and on my part. I couldn't consciously take somebody coming in from the outside, no matter who he was, over Mike Tomczak. When this whole thing was unfolding, first of all, how good did that make you feel that the team had your back? And uh, number two, did that give you even more confidence when you heard the team galvanized around you, even with uh, that situation? Does it make you feel good? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a team sport. And the guys in the locker room, you know, I think I earned their respect my rookie year when I made the ball club, I was one of the last guys that was lucky enough to make that roster mm-hmm. in 85. And, you know, it was, it was through hard work, being in the right place at the right time, having quality players around me and uh, players that believed in me. And, you know, Richard Dent, you know, Singletary, mm-hmm. Jim McMahon, Willie Galt, Jim, Jimbo Covert, Matt Suey, you know, there were a lot of Walter Payton, you know, there are a lot of guys that, um, uh, felt the same way as Jim McMahon felt. And by the way, Jim was an amazing teammate, amazing teammate. And, you know, he's taught me a lot, you know, not only through my early career, but, uh, you know, even today we share pleasantries and we just laugh and giggle and we kind of just have this bond that's everlasting. And, you know, it was one of those things that I wish I had the opportunity. We don't, we, we, we don't know the real outcome, but the reality was, uh, you know, the continuity was kind of, skewed a little bit because, you know, the hard work and the foundation we laid with, with me in the huddle, you know, directing these guys and being the field general was kind of severed to some degree. But, you know, believe it or not, maybe Washington was the better team that day. Maybe the Redskins just had everything going. They went to the Super Bowl that year, I believe. And, mm-hmm. You know, it was one of those things where, you know, it wasn't uh, my decision. And respectfully, as a team player, you know, maybe Dick would have liked to take that card back out of the deck and, put me in there did you like that as a as a as a coach and as a person I, or did he rub you the wrong way at times and i'm not saying you don't have ultimate respect for the man i mean you are winning and won the super bowl against odds against a media that didn't think you could do it a city that hadn't won since 63 but as you look back now i hear a lot of bears saying at the time and i've interviewed butthead and jim harbaugh and mcmahon and and jimbo Colbert since then the respect for Ditka has waned at times, but I think now when people see that they are the last team to win a Super Bowl and the only team in Chicago, I think that the players had the media against them at times, thinking they couldn't do it. They thought Ditka would be a, a failure his first year. He won last two years. And as we know, 
with the Mitch Trubisky thing, which we'll get through, get, get into in a minute. They don't know crap about football, but was that, is your respect still there for Ditka? And what did you think of him as a coach at the time? Unequivocally. He was the, uh, one of the best head coaches I've been around mm-hmm. and he believed in me. He decided to keep me on a team and, did we have our differences? Absolutely. There's not many quarterbacks that ever played this game that they might have right. a difference with their head coach or their position coach. You know, every decision I've made with the football wasn't the right decision. And coaches have to question that. That's their job. I've been in the coaching profession. That's our role and our job is to mentor and, you know, correct things that are correctable. And that's one thing that Dick always emphasized. You know, one thing that we can control is our controllables. And if it's a, if it's a force there by a physical mistake by somebody, we can correct that. But when it becomes a mental mistake, you know, time and time again, you know, then we got to have a serious conversation. And we've had them over the years, but I, I know one thing. Every time I call him on his birthday, I said, who's your favorite quarterback? He goes, you were, kid. And I don't know if he says it to everyone, but it means a lot to me to know that, you know, we reciprocate the same type of uh, respect for one another. And as a footnote, Mike, we would have never won the Super Bowl without him as our leader. Not even come close. Right, because he set the close. tone. He was the, the reason we beginning. won that Super Bowl. Yeah, he set the tone. Yeah, he set the tone at the very beginning. I was in business back in 1985, and then the Super Bowl in '86. It was the greatest year of business I ever had. I mean, the Bears were the talk of the town. It's sort of funny. We had Jordan with the Bulls, and they were treated like rock stars. Uh, I would say the 85 Bears were the first team. Not to have one or two personalities, but to have 53 personalities. I think that's a testament to the organization. <laughs> I think that's a testament to, to you guys. And that and Ditka, who was never known to be shy of words, uh, who fought with George Hallis, understood that. And you guys were, at times left uh, on your own reconnaissance, no matter what you said, but will you ever see a group of personalities on one football team like that again? Because I haven't. No, no. And, you know, Baltimore talks about, you know, they had the personalities that would equal ours when they won it in 2000, I believe. And, you know, it's amazing, uh, you know, getting back to that, what we talked about earlier, you know, mm-hmm. you have run-ins or differences. Look at your own life. Look at, you know, the biggest growth, that I've had as an individual is when you have some sort of controversy or sure. some, some form of adversity, you know, where does growth come from? You know, these aren't rehearsed routines you know, that, that come into your life. These are unexpected things. These are things that build over time and then it becomes an issue, but that's when you have a conversation. And there was a coach a long time ago, you know, offensive coordinator. I had a guy named Chan Gailey here in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. that would say, it's not who's right. It's what's right. You know, we're in a team game. I, I know a lot of coaches in the national football, NBA, major league, whatever profession you want, even in the corporate world. You know, greed really suffocates franchises. It suffocates businesses. It suffocates families, marriages. You know, greed is, is uh, it's, it's like kryptonite. And, you know, one thing that I've learned over time is that, um, You know, you just be thankful for what you had. And the experience I had, Mike, I couldn't ask for a better experience. I mean, talk about a reality experience. (laughs) You know, first and foremost, that was, you know, by the grace of God, you know, I was given an opportunity and it was amazing. Yeah, you guys were rock stars, no doubt about it. Um, When Flutie went to dinner, that was a big mistake, I think, by, by Ditka. I don't know. Did you ever go to dinner with Ditka? Did Jimmy ever go to? I'm sure you guys had meals together at at the training camp, maybe or whatever. But that seemed to be the straw that broke the camel's back with the team in a lot of ways. And uh, I felt bad for Flutie. I didn't take what Dan Hampton had to say uh, at 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 face value because Dan Hampton trashes McMahon. So you got to be out of your mind uh, to do that. I know the defense was great. But do you believe that uh, leading the league in rushing four straight years, do you believe that having one of the dominant quarterbacks, although often injured, and do you believe that Walter Payton, don't, I can't believe to this day, I know the defense was second to none, but the offense to me, and Jimbo Colbert has told me this, he's told me all the stuff you did, time of possession, 
it seems like the offense was neglected a lot of the time, and there's no way you win the Super Bowl without the superstars like Galt, McMahon, Payton, uh, Culvert, the line that you had. Uh, there's no way you win without uh, the offense. You could have the greatest defense in the world, but if you have no offense, it's going to be tough to win, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, not, not only Jimbo, but Jay Hilgenberg and Tom Thayer and, yep. you know, Bortzi and, and Horn, Emory Moorhead, Matt Suey. I mean, they took great pride, great pride in protecting the quarterback, controlling the flow of the game, dominate, be physical. I mean, we were no slouch on offense. We went against that defense time and time again in training camp and in, throughout the season, you know, to, to sharpen our spear. And we were we did get neglected, Mike, but, you know, the talk of the town was the bear defense. You know, monsters of the midway. <laughs> you know, that was a theme. That, that, that was a theme when I, even when I was growing up, you know. So it's, it's amazing, um, however you want to title it, but reality was, if it wasn't for our offense, we would have never made it through the playoffs. I agree wholeheartedly. I would ask you this, too. Uh, you said you practice against that defense. That was the best defense in football. So, you know, people talk about playing uh, other teams. Is there any chance in hell you weren't prepared for every team, especially with your starting record at one point was 18-3? and three. When you played other defenses, and back then you could hit or come at the quarterback. They didn't pity Pat like they do now. You know, it wasn't a soft game, so to speak. But when you played on Sunday, wasn't it somewhat easier than what you'd seen during the week at times? Oh, absolutely. The game slowed down, you know, on Sunday. You know, my biggest growth as, as a quarterback, as, you know, just fundamentally, skillfully, was practicing against our defense my rookie year. You know, talk about pressure in the pocket. You know, like you said, there was no sugar coating or, you know, you know, putting a marshmallow on the quarterback and all that stuff. I had no red jersey. I mean, I got the, I got the crap kicked out of me at times to practice. You know, the, our own players knocking me down. You know, mm-hmm. the Dents and the Otis and Wilbur and, you know, Singletary, Hartenstein, Tyrone Keys. You know, it's amazing. It just – they sharpen their spirits during practice. We had padded practices – and we had blitz period, and I thought for a while I was just a crash test dummy. You know, it was like one of those things where I got ping pong between McMichael and Hampton, and oh. I'd be laying flat on my ass, and nobody nobody was offering a hand. You know, that's called intimidation. So I said, "All right, guys, I'll bring it." You know, and then I bark out a cadence real loud, get him offside, and said, "All right, now who's in charge?" <laughs> so, yeah, I you know, it, 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 was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And the game slowed down, and the biggest growth I had, Mike, was that 85 season. I was a scout team quarterback. You know, I ran all the plays at Minnesota, Detroit, Tampa Bay, you know, in the, during that time, and all our opponents. So it was fun. I, I, I had great uh, fun doing that. Take great pride. I took great pride in getting our defense ready as well. Please describe to me how today's quarterbacks don't even know what it's like to be a quarterback of the 80s. <laughs> Oh, every once in a while, they'll put their hands underneath the center's ass and call for the ball. You know, mm-hmm. usually they're five or four and a half, five yards away from center now. And, you know, the professional football nowadays is just an extension of college football, mm-hmm. if you really look at it. Sure. It's a young men's game. It's fast. It's, it's uh, vertical. Uh, you get the ball out of the quarterback's hands and the playmaker's hands. And if the, you can't get it out of your hands, you better be an athlete. And there's probably a half a dozen athletes that are playing quarterback right now that are pretty spectacular. And, you know, the Marinos and the Plunkets and, you know, Tommy Kramers and, you know, whoever played for the Detroit Lions and Doug Williams and, you know, Theismann and Bert. I mean, all these guys were pocket passers. And, you know, the person that kind of gave us the greatest glimpse of what to expect four decades in the future it was probably Fran Tarkington. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a guy that would scramble around, scramble around. I mean, he would, he had a lot of rushing yards, man. Well, and uh, early on in Ben Sevens' career. Oh, yeah. I love early him. on he in Ben Sevens' career. I mean, yards. He and Bobby Douglas, he and Bobby Douglas. Were, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'll give you one, Mike. Mike. Or something for like 80 yards, you said. How about this? Michael Vick is one of a kind. Go ahead. 
Michael Vick is one of a kind. This guy's one of a kind. I'm sorry, I watched Randall Cunningham play for the Philadelphia Eagles back when you could destroy the quarterback. And he broke Bobby Douglas' rushing record. So I think history's been lost on a lot of people. I think these quarterbacks are very fortunate nowadays. They don't even know what it's like. I saw Baker Mayfield the other night get hit in the midsection. In the midsection, as soon as he released the ball, and there was an unnecessary roughness play where I used to see guys like you. Jimmy got picked up after a play and slammed to the ground. The game is completely different, which leads me to this. I saw your stats, but under today's rules, I always add 5% to 6% completion percentage going up because of the rule changes, because of the lack of hitting on the quarterback, because they're protected. Would I be right, or do you think you could have thrown for even a better percentage uh, from the 56 57% you threw, which was pretty good back in the day? Yeah, I, I, it could have been a lot better. I mean, I, I, I was just humbled to play the position, but, you know, there were times where, you know, I was a guy, and the offensive lineman loved me. You know, I would mm-hmm. get rid of the ball before a sack would occur. I would uh, throw the ball in the tight windows. I'd be a vertical guy. You know, because that was the quickest way to the end zone. We had speed on the outside early in my career. And we were able to take chances like that, even though there were 50-50 balls. But, you know, I was a guy that um, trusted what I saw and sometimes took risks that got our team in trouble. But, like I said, I didn't, never played a perfect game, made some poor decisions along the way, but made some great ones along the way as well. All right, now I want to switch over, if we can, to Mitch Trubisky, okay, because uh, I'm alone on an island, uh, which is, I'm sure, no surprise to you on this, but uh, the people that back Mitch Trubisky with me in this town, from the media to the, and I know we can talk about the Bear media in a minute, uh, to the Chicago Bears and to Matt Nagy, um, I've been alone. There's enough room for a dance floor in a phone booth with the people that believed in Mitch Trubisky like I did. But I want to ask you a question. I hear people calling him a bust. Now he's put up 30 points the last week, or 30 points a game the last three weeks. He's thrown for 63% his career, 9,000 yards, 61 touchdowns, 34 interceptions, okay, and the highest rated quarterback, including guys like Jimmy, Jay Cutler, and everybody else. Yet I hear the media torching him, and in a lot like the Flutie situation, the Bears welcomed, along with the media, and you know this, they used to get together at at practice during the summer before you guys would start the season, and all get together and and get together with bylines that they wanted to write that day. The 63%, 9,000 yards, 61-34 deal with the touchdowns, interceptions, and a 27-20 20 um, winning record. Is is it me, or do not many people know how really good that is for a guy that's had a lot of inexperience, 13 games in college, and I think is on the come, but most Bear writers and most Bear fans wouldn't know how to develop a quarterback, including me probably, because Jimmy was ready to play when he showed up, and so was Harbaugh because he was a coach's son. How about the unfairness of that, and what do you see in Mitch Trubisky that maybe you saw last week? I'm a fan of Mitch Trubisky's. The last 29 starts, he's 20 and nine. The most important stat, he's 20 and nine as a starter. Unbelievable. In the last 29 starts, I, yeah, that Hilgi was telling me, and you don't know what you have until you don't have it. And mm. I think, you know, when Mitch didn't, when Mitch lost that starting job. You know, I think he did a lot of self-reflection. He was obviously physically injured. He got hurt in a, in a little mop-up role when he had to go in. And this guy has grown up in the last two and a half weeks. And I think prior to that, I think he was getting overcoached. Mm-hmm. He's had three quarter, two quarterback coaches, two different offense coordinators, a head coach that, you know, is supposed to be an offensive guru. I mean, how many people do you want in your ear telling you things when you just want to go out there and play? And when he balls at his best, it seems like it comes natural to him. And, you know, look at the, some of the great ones, you know, that have played, you know, for Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers and Mahomes and people that extend plays and, you know, Lamar Jackson and Ben Roth. Those guys do it effort. They do the, they do the things that are abnormal, make it look normal. 
And I think that's where Trubisky is trending towards. And, you know, Chicago has never been a friendly quarterback town. Mm-mm. It's never been a friendly quarterback town. And, you know, I grew up there. I remember, you know, the, the Mike Phipps and, you know, the Douglases sure. and mm-hmm. Avellini and Vince Evans. I remember, you know, they want a quarterback that goes 20 for 20 for 250, three touchdowns yep. and no interceptions every weekend. Mike Dicka wanted that every weekend, but it's not possible. The game changes every play, every series. And I like the maturation that Trubisky has gone through these last two and a half weeks. And I wish him well these last three weeks. And if he stays healthy, I mean, there's a big market out there for quarterbacks and some general managers, if the bears don't do anything, are going to say, you know what? I like his, I've been following him since he came into the league and I like Mm -hmm. where he's at. We're going to lose him. Um, Would you agree? Because I, I agree with you. And here's another thing. No matter what happened in that Atlanta game, he says he got blindsided, and I agree. I think it was, uh, if it wasn't for COVID, they would have given the starting job to Foles. Matt Nagy stuck his neck out, and nobody stood up really for Trubisky. And it sort of reminds me of, in a perverse way, the Flutie situation. Bringing an outsider in instead of your own homegrown talent. And nobody battled it except me and a few others. And uh, the rest is history. Now, I would ask you this. Here's my suitors for Trubisky. The Bears are in a jam. They got to try to make it up to him, tell him we made a mistake. I don't know if they have a coach that's uh, contrite enough to do that. But uh, do you agree with me that my next three, four teams that are going to come after him are, one, New England, Cam Newton's a bust, and the Bear fans wanted him, two, Carolina, Teddy Bridgewater is on the downside for the most part. Bear fans wanted him. Um, and I think Indianapolis, I think there's four or five teams, but the one that I say, if the bears lose him, that they'll come after him with a vengeance is new England with Josh McDaniel, Bill Belichick. What's your take? Yeah. I mean, it it just takes one. It takes one, Mike. And I played for five different teams and, Mm -hmm. you know, one team didn't think you were that well, but as far as the bears saving face, you know, more importantly, some of these general managers are looking for a franchise quarterback and it's almost like a first round draft choice. You know, if Trubisky does become a free agent, you know, here's a first round draft choice with experience, with snaps, with a profile. And it would, would they enhance our ball? Well, maybe, maybe not, but I think uh, he's, it's trending upward. It's trending upward for him. And there are multiple teams because a lot of times it's a 50, 50, shot at whether a quarterback's going to succeed or not, whether it's the right system, the right players around him, uh, will the offensive line protect him, and are, do you have the right co- coaching staff, somebody that has played the position or been around the position and understand the nuances of the communication between the quarterback and the head coach or quarterback and offensive coordinator. It's a delicate, it's a delicate thing right now, Mike, because he is playing well. And it, as quickly as that dial was pointing down, I think it's pointing upward. Would you agree? Yeah, and I would ask you this. If he goes to Minnesota, because remember, he was benched for six weeks, unfairly in my opinion. Then they asked him to start against Green Bay. After they already told him he would never see the field again. Well, Nick Foles got hurt. He had a hip pointer. He was two yards from being out of bounds, and they had to bring a gurney out on the field for him. Then we find out the next day he's day-to-day. Ever since then, he's disappeared. But to put up 25 against Aaron Rodgers and to give up 41, he threw three touchdowns, two interceptions. Here's what's going to happen against Minnesota. He's going to have a good game. I think he'll put up points. But if he makes any mistakes, the people will be out of the woodwork again. And if they lose, they'll be out of the woodwork again, even if they put up 20, 24, 25 points. Because as you know, no matter what, if the defense has a bad day, but a team loses for the most part 28, 27, it always seems to be the quarterback's thought that he didn't do enough, doesn't it? And, and that was my experience here in Chicago, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can never do enough. Yeah, that's true. Well, I let said, me ask I you said this. that earlier. And... Let me ask you this, and then we're going to get turn it over to the man whose name is, is resonating in your heart, Aldo Gandia. <laughs> we have a couple questions from the chat board. You asked me the other day, is that a real, is that a man's real name? And yes, it is. And he'll be on with you shortly. He has the ultimate respect for you. Um, What was it like? And people don't talk about this enough. 
what was it like to change teams? And and what was the anxiety level? People, you know, you see baseball trades during the middle of the season. People got to relocate. Just give us a thumbnail sketch of what it's like to be a quarterback in the National Football League who's who's can be used as a starter or used as a backup and that goes to different teams and learns different playbooks. What was your anxiety level every time you played for a different organization? The anxiety level wasn't as high as you would think. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, going from Chicago, the first experience going from Chicago to Green Bay, you would think there'd be a lot of high anxiety because two rival teams, you know, but Lindy mm-hmm. Infante was, was fantastic when he talked to me. Uh, he said, here's your role. We like you. We played against you. You're going to come in. You're going to help this ball club out. And you're going to be very well respected. And, and you're going to fit in nicely in the locker room. And, and that's the biggest thing. When a quarterback changes teams, how does he fit in the locker room? How does he fit in the huddle? How does he fit in the classroom with the other quarterbacks? So I, I checked my ego in when I came into the National Football League. And I realized that my success is going to be solely related to how good the, your relationship is with the offensive lineman. And McMahon taught me that. I, I watched that with my own eyes. I experienced it by experiencing it with McMahon and the other offensive linemen. You win them over, they'll do anything for you. And that's what happened in Green Bay. I played a lot of snaps in Green Bay in 91. And then again in 92 when I switched, you know, I was out of football for a couple of weeks uh, after they traded for Brett Favre in Green Bay. Uh, I ended up going to Cleveland after Kozar got hurt. So going into that locker room, they were already in season. So they didn't have a chance to, you know, like me or dislike me. They knew I was the next man up, so to speak. And that transition was pretty smooth. I was just happy to get back in the National Football League with the Browns in 92. And then I get traded. I, I signed with another rival team, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Browns, going from the Browns to the Steelers. So, you know, it's interesting. Every team I went to, they would ask me, what did you guys do in Chicago? What was it like? What was the locker room like in Chicago? How'd you guys win all those championships, the divisions, you know? So that was, that was the Mount Rushmore, if you will. You know, the bears was always a measuring mark. Lindy Fonte would say, how'd they practice? What was their mindset? You know, did, did Dicka challenge them? You know, everyone was looking for that band aid to kind of fix something that was already hurt. And the winning tradition back then with the Chicago was amazing. The winning tradition in Pittsburgh was amazing at the time when I joined their franchise and the two fran- three franchises that really didn't have much going from a traditional standpoint were the Browns Packers and Detroit. And it was pretty obvious when you walked in, you kind of knew that the expectation level wasn't as high in green Bay or wasn't as high in Detroit as it was in those championship cities in Chicago and Pittsburgh. One quick last one before Eldo comes on. Uh, I saw that people were saying, well, Mitch played an easy team, even though Houston was favored. There's no easy games in the National Football League. But that was the excuse people who like Foles or are against Mitch were saying. I would ask you this. Tom Brady, in my opinion, and I think I, many people's opinion, is the greatest quarterback of all time. But he played in the AFC East, where the record for New England, it's not just because of Tom Brady, was 35-3. and three. Can you put into words the 108 games he played in the Eastern Division where he won 89 games out of the 20? How important that was for him to be a six-time quarterback and to have patsies on his schedule within the division every year. A lot like you guys had back in the mid-'80s when Green Bay was suffering, Detroit's always suffered, and Tampa Bay was a doormat. Well, he was definitely elite. But I guarantee you, he's not going to apologize for the lack, no. lack of talent with other ball clubs. <laughs> and and uh, I heard Mike Tomlin, you know, during that 11-game winning streak, we're not going to apologize for victories. Right. <laughs> you know, we got a lot of work to do, but I'm not going to apologize for the other team's inefficiencies. Our goal is to win championships and win games, and, you know, that was Brady's mindset. That was New England's mindset. Mm-hmm. And I think when you look at the dynasties, you know, even in the 70s with the Steelers, late 70s, early 80s, that was their sure. mindset going against teams that were, you know, less talented. So it's a, it's a fine line, Mike. I mean, to win a National Football League, that's an achievement week in and week out. And a lot of teams wish they were in a position where um, the Steelers are right now, 
you know, sitting at 11 and two, I believe 11. I think it's 11 and two, right, 10 and two and or two. whatever. Yeah. 11 and two. So, uh, you know, it's just challenging. It's challenging to win in the national football league every week. And consequently, when you don't win, you end up getting fired as a player, you're getting fired as a coach. So the owners never get fired. It's only somebody else. <laughs> Well, I tried to take care of Michael, and by the way, I know he's passed away, and I, I, that was very unfortunate, but he went through some tough times after that season that we won it all. I got my gut, my pal, my partner, Eldo Gandia, ready to ask you a couple questions from people on the chat board and, and from himself. Eldo? Mike, uh, Tom Zach, great interview. Thank you very much for being a, a part of the show, listening to you and Mike North uh, talk about the 1980s Bears. I, you know, Mike has been following the Bears since the early 60s, me from the late 60s, and that era of the Chicago Bears, the 80s era, was the most fun time that I ever had, and I think Mike North will agree with me that that was just the best time ever to be rooting for the Chicago Bears, and you were a big part of that, Mike Tomzak, and, and thank you for the t- the sacrifices you made to your body uh, and the the mental sa- toll that, that, that it took to be a member of Chicago. You said Chicago's not a quarterback-friendly team, and so I, I know exactly where you're coming from because you guys get so much heat, man, from the fans. It's unbelievable. I agree with you. Um, thank you for those compliments, Aldo, and pleasure talking with you as well, and to your listeners. Yeah, there's a fine line at the quarterback position and, you know, the physical and mental wear and tear on your body, you know, it adds up over time, but I'm feeling good. I'm happy for the experience and, you know, thank God that I still have my faculties and I'm able to uh, be as pliable and flexible as possible at age 58. And I think I could still hand off and throw a couple of slant <laughs> routes and go routes and I can make an... I can make an impact. I know that. Uh, I, I bet you could. I got a buddy uh, named Dan Aguirre who I, yeah. I told him that you were going to be on the show. And he goes, I got to gotta ask him a question. And, and Dan is like the Wikipedia of the Bears bar room. He just knows everything about the Chicago Bears. This is a question that he came up with right off the top of his head. This is how much he knows the Bears and you. Your last game as a Chicago Bear was at the Meadowlands, second round of the playoffs. We lost to the New York Giants. And that would be your last game as a Bear. The Giants would go on to win the Super Bowl. Do you think if there's some chance if the if if the Bears beat the Giants that day, even if you lose to San Francisco in the championship game, do, do you think you're brought back as a Bear? Do you think the Bears' job the next year is yours versus Harbaugh and that you play your entire career out as a Chicago Bear? Great question. Great question. I, I believe they already had their mind made up. I think I was a threat to Harbaugh. Uh, since he was a second round draft choice, you know, I was playing better than he was and management had to, their hand was forced, their hand was forced and they had to make a decision. So I, I, I figured, um, you know, the decision was made before the game, win or lose. And, hmm. you know, I, they might've gotten some drawback from the head coach at the time, but, uh, we'll never know the answer. Will we? Yeah, the business of football, unbelievable. Now, you went on and uh, uh, became an offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh team in the Arena Football League, and so what was that experience like? And you said earlier in the interview with North that, you know, pro football has become like college football. I, I sometimes equate it to arena football, uh, given, you know, how, how, uh, how fast pace and, and pass-oriented arena football is. Tell us about your experience as an offensive coordinator and, and the whole arena league uh, NFL correlations. Yeah, I, I, I had a lot of success uh, just un- trying to understand the game. Uh, I watched it for many years. I think it's been around since the mid-'80s. Mm-hmm. arena football i know chicago had some good teams back in the day and even in the 90s and i had an opportunity in pittsburgh with the pittsburgh power uh they needed some assistance and i was willing to take on that role uh fast furious accuracy physical real physical game a lot like the nfl but uh i think college football is a better analogy than the arena football because we had high motion that would put the offense at an advantage uh the fast pace part of it, even though you're up by two touchdowns with 20 seconds left, uh, the game was never at hand. <laughs> the, the opponent felt like they were still in the ball game. Mm-hmm. And uh, very exciting. I, I had a great uh, experience with that and met a lot of neat, neat people. But uh, these guys were $500 millionaires a week. 
the guys I coached, you know, they're making <laughs> five to 800 bucks a, a wow. week and they, they thought they were millionaires. And, <laughs> you know, it was exciting to just be around guys that really loved the game and was looking for an opportunity. Great. Um, again, thanks very much for being on. This has been a, a thrill for all of us Chicago Bears fans and, and listening to you and, and catching up with you. I'll turn it back over to Mike North. All right. Thanks, Aldo. And, Mike, we want to wish all you All right, Aldo. Thank you. Yeah, Mikey, we want to wish you nothing but the merriest of Christmas. Happy holidays. We appreciate you being on. Uh, it, it's good to hear from you. Many fans had not hear, heard from you for a long time. And, and once again, I, 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 I know Munch had you on he says i said tell munch all right i said tell mike i'd like to get him and you were very gracious and i appreciate that and you just continued to do what you keep doing mike and that's winning okay thank you guys and i wish you a happy holidays be safe through this pandemic and um, be well be kind it doesn't take much talent thanks mike well said mike tomsack former chicago bear not on the airwaves too often I want to thank my buddy once again out there in Cleveland who hooked me up. And Aldo, I thought that he was right on with a lot of stuff. Oh, my I goodness. I really did. Yes. Uh, his, his, he, I mean, he could be an, anal, an analyst for any and, of the major networks. He's better than a lot of the guys I've been hearing on Sundays do some of these football games. <laughs> you know what? we got more things to talk about, but Mike Tomsick, I think, laid it out. He sure Mitch did. Trubisky's an arrow pointing up. Right, and, and you're never going to make everybody happy. And he basically said that, and we've seen it, no matter what you do as a quarterback in this town, it's pretty rough. I mean, Jim McMahon got criticized. So uh, Jim Harbaugh got criticized. Interesting comments about Harbaugh yeah. that basically uh, he was sent packing. And a good question by Dan. I mean, really good question about that. Yeah. So uh, thanking Mike Tomczak once again. So uh, we got Bears. Uh, you know, I know that they're going to be playing uh, – uh, Minnesota this week, the pressure's on everybody. Yeah. I mean, once again, I mean, the defense finally put a game together, so we'll see what happens. I thought if they played like that the previous four or five games, who knows? Uh, we got a couple turnovers. Maybe Foles is still quarterback because Mike Tomczak at one point was 18-3 and three as a starter. Mm-hmm. And Mike was a pedestrian quarterback. But he did the right things, didn't turn over the football, and they had a great defense. Speaking of pressure, Mike... <laughs> Nice. Had East Illinois, Eastern Illinois, they lost. Had Clemson, they won. <coughs> Excuse me, an NCAA basketball. Now, we got some games starting up at noon, okay? And uh, I want everybody to pay attention. Make sure that you go uh, to Bears Bottom. The podcast will be up about 11 o'clock, although it might be a little later today because we are, uh, we're still doing pretty good, but we're over our time. But I thought Tom Zick was... Just too good to let go. Sometimes Absolutely. you get a guy, right, that makes so much sense mm-hmm. that you got to keep him on. So I'm going to give you a couple quick games here. First of all, I'm going to take, ladies and gentlemen, Richmond minus the six and a half. It's a, a one o'clock game uh, here in Chicago. College basketball playing Vanderbilt. Okay, uh, Vanderbilt is considered the home team in this one. Richmond getting six and a half on the road, and then. We have Toledo playing Marshall. Not in football, but this is a 6 o'clock game. Uh, Toledo versus Marshall. Marshall is a a 7-and-a-half favorite, 7-and-a-half point favorite. I'm taking Toledo plus the 7-and-a-half. Eldo, back to you. All right, so I got it here. It's uh, Richmond with the minus 6-and-a-half on the road Mm -hmm. against Vanderbilt. That's where you put the money on. And Toledo yep. Marshall, uh, Marshall is favored by seven and a half, and you uh, are advising Toledo. So I got it here. Absolutely handsome. All right. And now I want to talk, I want to get to your thoughts on James McCann, because I, like you, was just a huge, huge fan of this mm-hmm. catcher for the White Sox, but he is now gone. Your thoughts on the departure of James McCann? Oh, I love him. I think we're a weaker team. Mm-hmm. If you try to tell me you're stronger – now than you were last year, you're insane. Grandel, I've talked to uh, people in Los Angeles that I worked with at Fox Sports Radio. They were happy to get rid of him. I, I guess I'll make the comparison since I've been right about the first one. I'll just make these, put these two names together. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. And because both were unnecessary signings. The first ones are mine, okay? Trubisky-McCann. 
Foles, Grandel. $77 million, McCann saw, uh, uh, goes for 40 with the Mets. Sox could have signed him, but they went ahead and jumped the gun, didn't believe in McCann, and maybe, like people said, Grandel's a better hitter. We need defensive catcher. We need a guy, at, and he's not, and I don't care what anybody says. I've seen them both play, and, and I'll get my uh, every per, a Dodger fan out there where he had one of the worst games in history in a playoff game with two pass balls, catcher's interference, and it cost them. And they'll tell you they were happy to let him go. But once again, I'm hearing the same nonsense I heard about Bowles with Grandel. Grandel does have a better track record, and I'm just going to let it go now. But we could have had McCann for $30 million less. The Sox didn't believe in him, just like the Bears didn't believe in Mitch. And now they got a problem at backup catcher. Maybe they've really moved, in my opinion, to backup catcher to starter, a lot like Foles was the backup uh, in Jacksonville after he lost his starting job, and they tried to make him a center with the, uh, uh, the center of attention with the Bears. Wow. That's my opinion. I, and it's a good and, you one. Know, people go, that's a trash take, or that's a bad take. Explain to me why. Yes. Be smart and remember who you're talking to. You're not talking to Jimmy, who works at the gas station. <laughs> you have to give me some concrete evidence here. I've been paid, I've been paid millions of dollars for 28 years. Okay, to give my opinion. And I never once said, that's a crap opinion, or you suck north, or anything like that. Give me something substantial. Otherwise, you lose the argument right from the beginning. There you go. Well said. Let's talk a little bit about the North Sider. Scott Boris, the uh, player agent who represents Chris Bryant. He sort of says, you know, the Cubs have some big plans for Chris Bryant, but then at the same time, he's talking about there is no deal, there is no nothing going on. What do you think here? You know, Scott is one of the master negotiators. Uh, do you think that Chris Bryant is going to be a Chicago Cub long term, or do you think that he could be on the trade market, or do you think he's just going to play one more year with the Cubs? What are your thoughts? Can I tell you a Scott Boris story first? Please. I believe he was Alex Fernandez's agent. He came on the year, and he wanted $35 million for five years, okay, from the White Sox. Mm-hmm. And I told him straight out, he's out of shape. I think he'll have arm problems down the line, and that it won't work out. He got offended. So how can you say he's out of shape? I said, because I got eyes, Okay. <laughs> And it didn't turn out well. We argued back and forth. Back when you could do that. Right. And uh, (laughs) that was it. He went and he won a World Series with Miami. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. With Florida. Mm -hmm. But his tenure ended up just like I thought. Yeah. Okay? But they did get their one. But I was not sad to lose him. And Boros is the master, unless you could see right through him. They got big plans because they can't get rid of Chris Bryant, okay? Chris Bryant is yesterday's newspaper. He's damaged goods. You don't, Davey Martinez, in a damaging statement, they asked him, have you thought about Chris Bryant? He said, not for two years. Not for two years. That's how far his star has fallen. Here's what the Cubs are going to do, in my opinion. I think they're hoping, and I think they're telling Chris Bryant, you've got to have a great first half, and then I think they trade him. There you go. I, I, I think they trade them. Yeah, I, it's beginning to look that way. I, I totally agree. You know, I I've never seen a guy fall so far. Yeah, I can't imagine that his trade stock is anywhere close to what it was. You well, know. they don't want to sit somebody who's got a rash under his arm and he sits. <laughs> they don't want to see a guy that when he gets into a slump all of a sudden disappears. <laughs> He's had too many inconsistencies, still swings at the same pitches he swung at four years ago. 2016 was his best year, and you need something more. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen a whole lot, neither of Cub fans, and I've got to be honest with you. He had nothing but allies four years ago, and I think most Cub fans are ready to move on from the Chris Bryant deal. Yeah. I'm with you. I, th- I think I, yeah. a lot of Cub fans are ready to move on. And uh, do you think the Cubs could just move into total rebuild uh, mode under Jed Hoyer? And, uh, you know, I, I got a feeling that uh, the Ricketts family just wants to start shedding salary and, and start over. Well, I think you got to be suspicious because they had no gate. Baseball teams don't project that they're going to have a bad year at the gate, especially if they're the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> damn right. And the Chicago 
the Chicago Cubs, and they live year to year. There's radio stations mm -hmm. that are suffering economically because baseball teams that are on their stations mm. weren't allowed, okay, to play right. for a while. Right. And uh, they lost that revenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, then their talks, they had to turn to talk, which they had ignored because they get so much money from the teams. So I think that I think the Cubs are still going to go for it. I still think that division can be won. Mm -hmm. I think the beginning of the end with the Cubs, Aldo, mm -hmm. and I said this years ago, I don't care what he's done since, is when they got rid of Arietta. Mm -hmm. That was a I know I know they brought back Darvish, but Arietta was a Cy Young Award winner, and I know he's not as good as he was. But that sent the signal, we're going to get rid of our attitude guy. Mm -hmm. And I just got done reading, Jesse's going to be shocked at this, Jesse Rogers' uh, book on Madden, uh -huh. Try Not to Suck. And Madden did the opposite. He did suck because <laughs> the lack of detail after the 2016 season mm -hmm. where Jesse details that players were allowed to do and be whatever way they wanted during spring training, I think was the beginning of the end of Joe Madden. And I think if they had a more stern manager, and I give Madden credit for winning it the first year, instead of digressing, and I think if they had a more disciplinarian manager, they would have uh, maybe prospered and maybe won another one. And I think the Cubs saw that, and that's why he was sent back. In. Yeah. Now, you, you talked about, you know, radio stations losing revenue because the, the baseball season is cut. The, the Players Association is still negotiating with major league owners on the length of the season, when it should start, and so forth. What is your take on that? Because, frankly, I've always thought that the 162-game regular season is just too long, and now they've added playoff uh, rounds and so forth. I'd like to see a shorter season and maybe even a more expanded playoffs. What's your thought? Well, I'll give you a perfect example. They should never change from the 162 because the records are set now, and they're never going to do that unless they – because, believe me, you think they're going to cut down the games once this COVID thing is over? <laughs> they want to recoup all that money. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I really believe that uh, Major League Baseball, look, I'll give you a perfect example. The, the Cubs are after Jackie Bradley Jr., mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I read a guy the other day because he had his best year ever. <laughs> he played 60 games or whatever. <laughs> You can't judge a guy like that. That's a third Look of at the his season. batting average. Look him up real quick while we're on here. Mm -hmm. Look him up real quick. Jackie Bradley Jr. Look up his batting averages every year, folks. Okay. Jack. I'll ask Elder to do it. You know what you're going to see? 220, 230. He had 280 this year in 60 games. Mm -hmm. The reason they play 162 games is because he wouldn't have hit 280 if he played 162 games. Mm -hmm. Does I'll get, I'll be, Jose Abreu has always been consistent. Mm -hmm. But if he plays 162 games, does he still win the MVP? Mm -hmm. There was like 120 games, I mean 100 games, that were basically taken away. Yep. And, you know, the Washington Nationals, for instance, two years ago, they never win the World Series if they only play 60 games. Yeah. Jackie so Bradley Jr. I don't think this What tell us about Jackie Bradley Jr.'s batting average well, he hit while, we're, while we're hearing how great he was <laughs> in a limited season last year. <laughs> That's right. And, and uh... 55 games last year, he hit 283. Then in 147 games in 2019, he hit 225. The year before that, in uh, 535 at bats, he hit 234. The year before that, when he had 541 at bats, he hit 245. So, uh, yeah, he has not uh, had a great <laughs> batting average. <laughs> so all I'm saying is, if they play 60 games, I love the kid. They play 160, he'll be a good defensive player, but he's going to crap the bet at it's not hard to look at. But you know who doesn't tell you that? The people that lack. I, you, know, you didn't even know it probably. No, I, I didn't. did the research. Nice. What has made this guy so good all of a sudden? The COVID restrictions. <laughs> 60 games. Yeah. I'm sorry. You can look at it any way you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, I'll give a play you this. He was ready to play. But look at some of the superstars this year that weren't, and look what they hit. Mm -hmm. When you play 100, when they play 162 games, they'll be back. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, before we get out of here, I need, I absolutely need to get your take on the Chicago Bulls. They've got two preseason games under their belts. 
They played the Houston Rockets. They were one and one got blown out in their first game and then came back and played some decent f- basketball against the Rockets in their second game. Of course, this is just to kind of get a test for a look, a peek at, at some of the players and some of the coaching style of Billy Donovan. Frankly, I was very impressed with his post-game comments. After that first game, Donovan says, we got our asses kicked, and that's a good thing because we, now we know what we need to work on. What's your thoughts on the Chicago Bulls so far? Well, he's got to undo 17 years. Well, not 17 years, but he's got to do, let's just say this, he's got to undo the boiling era mm. where nobody was developed. Yeah. I mean, where the coach was overmatched, uh, where they basically – we're playing run and gun. This is Billy Donovan, two-time NCAA champion. I'm impressed with the way he's handling the team. Uh, I like their first-round pick. I think his name is Williams. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, Patrick Williams. Um, Patrick Williams. Oh, he looks he – looks, I don't know what he did last night, but uh, I loved him. I loved his smooth touch. I mm-hmm. loved the way that he went after the boards, and it's a different guy picking the players now. Yep. But uh, we'll see what happens. I do agree that having a great coach, putting in a new culture – was about time, so uh, I'm hopeful for the Bears. I mean, for the I mean, excuse me, the Bulls, and uh, I, I'm just more interested uh, because they weren't even trying the previous five six years, and I think the fans knew it that ownership wasn't trying, and and it's just refreshing to have. And I think this guy, you know, nobody's going to tell me, and I know that Paxson still got their door next to Reinsdorf, but nobody's going to tell me Paxson made this pick. This pick is a, is is the new guy's pick, yep. and 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 the kid's going to be okay. Yeah. Another thing that Donovan said that I really liked, he said, "I know that the offense is sometimes going to be hard for this team, but we, as long as we follow the fundamentals and and don't give up energy on the other side of the court, then we're going to be fine." So he's instill, instilling a culture of effort of not getting down on yourself when the ball doesn't go in as long as you're taking high percentage shots moving the ball around and so forth and then playing tough defense i like his approach whereas with jim boylan i don't know what the hell he was teaching other than they just they they were failing at the time and they continued to fail but i will tell you this i i really mean this Mm -hmm. i want and i said this on twitter for instance wendell carter I want him to spend more time on his game and watching film, and even Stacey King has brought that up, mm-hmm. that you got to watch the scouting film. Mm-hmm. He was sort of alluding that maybe some guys hadn't done that in the past. But I want Wendell Carter and other Bulls to pay more attention to the game or, or to pay as much attention to the game of basketball as they do to their hairstyles. <laughs> Wendell Carter, the first game, couldn't play dead, yet he had little ornaments hanging from his hair <laughs> as he was running down the court. I, I, I just want them to quit trying I don't care. You could you could have hair that looks like Don King's, okay? <laughs> All right? And if you're playing well, I'm accepting it. But if you're trying to, you know, be different and be cool with your hairdo, look at my hairdo and everything else, which a lot of players do, but your game sucks. Uh, you're spending time on the wrong thing. It sounds petty. It sounds like, hey, Grandpa, forget about No. 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 I saw Wendell Carter. I think he can be better. I think he's a little bit soft right now. Uh-huh. Uh, he gets frustrated. But remember, they were all miscoached, including him. Yeah. So, you know what? I'm starting everybody anew. I just had a little, I, you know what? A little less time on the hair, a little more time on the scouting report, <laughs> like Stacey King says. I didn't notice that. What do you have? Christmas ornaments on his hair or something? He has little, little uh, balls <laughs> hanging from his hair all the way around the first game. You can run it back and see it. It's very attractive, but I mean, come on. <laughs> I think it's for the Christmas season. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, check out his picture. It's beautiful. I like Hey, I want him to do well. I'm a, bear, I'm a Chicago fan. Yes. I want him to do well. But when they don't want to do well, they deserve all the criticism in the world. And they didn't want to do well for a while. Yes. I mean, this is, not the, this is not the organization that Jordan built up. It isn't. And, 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 and believe me when I tell you this, I don't think it's a reach that if we hadn't had gotten Georgia... Jordan, uh, Jordan, we want to have a championship. Period. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm percent. God bless Jerry oh, yeah. Krause. He, he, uh, he did a lot of great things, but yes, he, he was, did. he was handed a, a beautiful thing when he accepted that job to be the GM of the Chicago Bulls. He was handed Michael Jordan, so it made it a little easier. Yeah, he was handed Michael Jordan, but I always tell people. He, he traded Olin Polonese for Pippen. Yep, big move. He, he brought in Horace Grant. Yep. When he lost Grant, he brought in Rodman. Right. I mean, look at, let's go to the Bears real quick. Mm-hmm. 
you know who's a stud? And you can't criticize Pace for this one. My cousin, Cole Komet. He's a stud. Oh, my god. Period. Gosh. Yes. He's a stud. We have a tight end for 10 years. He's a stud. Mm-hmm. So when people point at Pace, he did fail a quarterback. There's no doubt in people's eyes. But down the line, if he builds a team and we draft nothing but offensive linemen and speed receivers mm-hmm. and maybe a defensive player or two mm-hmm. to help Eddie Jackson learn to play safety again, <laughs> um, then, then I think we got a good shot at being a good franchise over the next two, three years. Mike, Cole Komet... He, he has been throwing the ball. Over the last two games, he has seen seven targets and seven targets. That's 14 times he's been throwing the ball. Before that, he had 14 the entire season. It's like, why did it take so long to throw the ball to this incredibly talented tight end who on one play, he left the field and said, nobody can tackle me. Nobody can bring me down. Nobody. That's the kind of player you want on the Chicago Bears, and that's the kind of player you got to feed the ball to. Your cousin, Cole Komet. And they worked out. I don't know if Cole worked out a whole lot with them, but the Bear offense worked out in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Cole was there, yeah. Robinson, all those guys. Right by my house, yeah. And then they, and then they replaced him with, 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 with Nick Foles, <laughs> uh, who didn't work out with them all year. So I want to congratulate the Bears for basically just waiting for Watson and ending that debate. And I'm going to tell everybody else this. You made I made this prediction already on the odds couple. Eric Bieniemy is the assistant offensive coordinator, not the OC, because he doesn't call the plays. Andy Reid does, just like Nagy didn't call the plays, except for a playoff game they bombed in. Okay, Eric Bieniemy will leave Patrick Mahomes and go to Jacksonville or some other crap team without Patrick Mahomes and fall on his face. Mm-hmm. You heard it from me right here first. The reason these guys get jobs is because Andy Reid finally got a Super Bowl, but they got Michael Jordan at quarterback, period. They even, when they play bad, they they come back and win. Like, they, they were losing last week, and then they just went off. You can't stop the kid. So when you take a coach from Kansas City, remember, you're not taking Mahomes. There you go. Mike North, another great show, another great guest. You are on fire from the opening bell to the last uh, second of play here. I was a little hard on everybody a little bit. I've been hearing the nonsense for for a week. (laughs) Oh, are you playing an easy team? Please. And I tell them, when anybody says play an easy team, I basically tell them, give the phone back to your mom. Okay? I love the trash talk. I love it. I love it. I love love the trash talk on Twitter. Sometimes I'm on it all day, and I know sometimes I get a little carried away, but so do other people. At least I give reasons. But seriously, (laughs) this has been one of my greatest weeks ever up until uh, a day or two ago. So, you know, basically, I'm just happy, and, uh, and I hope the Bears win. But if they lose forty to thirty, uh, if they if, if Mitch doesn't play a good game, he'll be out. They'll be out to get rid of him again, and and draft some guy named Kyle Trask or somebody else, and we'll have to wait another three four years. Please give BB a great big hug from me, and I got a great big hug for you, brother. Uh, I hopefully we can see each other face to face soon, uh, and we'll see okay. you next week. Okay. That's it, buddy. I love you. Take okay. care. I love you too.